just got the first copy of my book. Prior to entry, and you posted by Google Immigration Services. Hi, how are you? It's Brett Moore here. Fantastic service. Always recommend me. John. Morning, Brandon. How are you, buddy? No glasses today? I'm just cleaning them. You're cleaning yeah. them. Getting ready for another another installment here, are you? Yeah, there I got some sort of dirty crud on my lens. I've got to get rid of it. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. That's okay. It's real. This is unscripted. So um how's everything over there? Start to the week. It's great. It's, great. It's, a, it's a nice day. It's frankly it's hard to be inside right now, but there you go. I'm happy to be here with you and everybody else. That's amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, we're crying here today because we lost last night, but I, again, didn't see that one coming. The Leafs lost again. Yeah, well, you could always pull a Vancouver and riot. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. I, was, I don't even know what to say. I actually almost, yeah, I won't even say what I was going to say. Okay, go, let's go. Go Blue, go Blue Jays. Yeah, go Blue Jays. Yeah. Um, Anyways, hey, listen, uh, so John and I were sitting here and we we're trying to figure out what we were going to talk about. And it's funny, we were thinking about all of the different things and, and some of the big pitfalls that people fall into without even uh, thinking about it. So we've come up with the top 10 immigration mistakes. OK, and these are things that people will do um, without maybe even knowing and, and on different programs, uh, there's different pitfalls. So we wanted to talk about that. Um, I like to call it the pit of snakes. Do you remember, uh, those books, those choose your own adventures? Sort of. You remember those books, you'd read the book and then basically it'd be like, oh, if you're going to do this, you go this way. If you're going to do this, then turn to this page, right? It's like, oh, wah, wah, you landed in the pit of snakes, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate our way through. But before we do that, let's introduce ourselves, John. Why don't you take it off? Go for it. Hello, everybody. My name is John Laroni. I live out in Surrey, BC. The owner and operator, director, um, chief guy at uh, Gateway Pacific Immigration. And you can find me at gatewaypacific.ca. I, uh, I practice in almost all areas of immigration except things like refugee and highly complex humanitarian compassionate stuff but uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, reach out to me at uh, gatewaypacific.ca or through Brandon here at Second Passport. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Hey, we just got a love there from Winda. Hi Winda, I haven't seen you in a while. How you been? I hope you're doing well. If you have any questions, toss, toss them in there. But uh, Winda's from Indonesia. Hi Winda. And, yeah, she's great. Um, awesome, so uh, okay. Well, let's dive in there. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce myself. So my name is Brandon Miller. Um, I own and operate Maple Immigration Services. Uh, we're based in Toronto. I know, very sad today with the Leafs loss today. Um, but I do, uh, I do mostly economic type immigration, family, things like that. Um, so yeah, I've been at it for about 10 years. Um, yeah, that's it. And John and I cooperate on uh, something called Second Passport. Uh, Second Passport is basically the ability for you to, to be able to do your own type of application with some guidance, uh, but basically choose your own journey. We've got a really great thing called the Immigration Blueprint. We're doing a live one starting on July 19th. Uh, feel free to check that out. And without further ado, let's dive in. What do you say, John? Sure thing. And Apologies in advance. Uh, the garbage truck just went by. I didn't. I hope I didn't drown you out. Oh, that's what I was wondering. I was like, "Is that me?" And I was kind of, yeah. But anyways, it was a garbage truck, huh? Cool. Let's move on. Uh, okay, John. What are we gonna do? What's the first one? Well, one of the things is considering only one immigration program. Quite often, people will think, "Great, look, you know, they analyze their position or they get some advice." And they, they come to the conclusion that they're in for one immigration program. But, you know, if you look carefully, you may be eligible for even two or maybe even more, depending on, you know, a whole number of factors. Now, are you living with a Canadian citizen or permanent resident? Well, hey, then you may be family class eligible. Uh, you've got Canadian work experience. Great. You're Canadian experience class eligible. But if you also have a job offer, you mean you could be eligible under a provincial nomination program. So, 
you know, you've got to look at all your options. And it's uh, that is one of the pitfalls I see. Do, do you see this very often, Brandon? I get it all the time. It, it usually goes like this. People will call up and they'll be like, hey, uh, you know, I qualify for express entry. I want to do this. I want to do that. This is my thing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, how much is it? I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. Because it's it's if you think about it, right? That's like that's like going into a doctor and saying, "Hey, doc, you know, I'm I'm this. This is what's wrong with me. I think I have this disease. Give me a prescription." It's like, slow down, you know. And again, what John and I try to do for people is we try to find the easiest, quickest, most direct, and most cost-effective pathway through an immigration system. And again, immigration, like any other government bureaucracy, it's it's a government bureaucracy like anywhere in the world. So you want to get in and out of that as quick as possible. Yeah. I'll give you a great example. It just came to my mind. I spoke with a guy. He called me up and he says, I got this guy that wants to hire me. Uh, I got a job offer. I need an LMIA. And I'm like, hey, right? LMIA. No, like worst thing you can do. Right. And then I said, but he's under 35 and he's from Australia. And I'm like, young professional. Uh international experience class will cost you 150 bucks and you can get here and you don't have to go through LMIAs and trust me, your employer will be happy. Yeah. Easy peasy, right? It's because a lot of people, they look at one program and they think like this and they, they don't know that there's like 75 plus categories. So yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Hey guys, I just, before we go on to the second one, um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them in there. Uh, we're just going to keep talking about the top 10 things. We're going to do five today and five on Thursday, but uh, feel free to derail us and ask us if you have any questions or if there's any concerns. And on that note, I'm just going to give a shout out to Winda. Hi, hi, Winda. Thank you for that. I really appreciate you showing up. It's amazing. Uh, let's go on to number two, John. What's number two? Wrong NOC code. But for those of you who don't know what the NOC is, it's the National Occupation Classification, which is basically the government of Canada years ago decided that they were going to sit down and codify every single occupation in the country. And, you know, they, they achieved, I would say, moderate success in that, in that way. Um, and the reason why I say moderate success is that the NOC codes are not perfect. They can't capture or encapsulate every single position that exists out there. Uh, so when you are applying under numerous, numerous programs, you have to decide and commit to one NOC code and, and therein it gets a bit tricky. Um, the example I used to some of my students in the past is the difference between a chef and a cook. The, uh, the occupations are so close yep. uh, in, in similarity, but there's some important differences and some cooks may think they're a chef and some chefs may think they're a cook. Well, not yeah. a lot of chefs think they're a cook, but the, the my point is, is that uh, you have to take a close look at the job you did or the job you're going to do, really boil down those job duties to figure out which NOC code uh, is applicable to you. Now, why is this important? Uh, it's important because if you choose the NOC code in the worst case scenario, your application could be refused. And you're it's, back it's, to one it's and the window of opportunity could have been lost forever. Uh, it's it's unfortunate. I've seen this a few times in my my career where the wrong NOC code has been chosen, and it's devastating to some people. Yeah. So uh, I just want to add in a few things to what John just said. So uh, using the wrong NOC code can be fatal. If you're doing an economic type application, like John alluded to, this is the crux of of the application, and the reason is is that. To do uh, an economic type application, you need to you need to have skilled work experience. And if you're misclassifying that uh, NOC code, or you actually aren't, uh, it isn't skilled work experience, et cetera, et cetera. That's a problem. The other thing that people I find is that people will, you know, they'll be doing jobs, and they're like, I don't know which one to choose. Like, yeah. I do this, and then I do this but it's kind of two and I can only choose one. What should I do, right? That's where you really have to dive in to what your job duties are, what the lead statement, that first little section of the NOC is, what the job duties are, what the education and what the requirements. And you have to pay particular attention to things like may be required or 
usually, like they use the words may and usually a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think that's huge. Um, and it's tricky. It's tricky, but I don't want you know, uh, as as you tell me sometimes, Brandon. God, John, don't be so negative. Uh, I'm not going to be too you know so ne <laughs> negative about this. As long as you're careful, and you you know you you really pour over what you've done, and you have the NOC code. Like for instance, what when Brandon and I do this, we have the NOC code there, and we have the client's job offer letter there, and we really just you know go like line, word, line by line, yeah. line by line, making sure that they meet, and you know. It's uh, it's not uh, a dead end. You just have to be careful. Yeah, that's uh, totally totally agree with that. The other thing that I want to point out on that too uh, is where when John sorry I just remembered this because you were saying about how we classify the jobs right. Mm -hmm. These generally uh, it's a good it's a good system and most countries have something similar to this to classify the jobs. However. This is based on statistics, and statistics generally happen. I think. What do we do the census every six years or something? Is that just happening now? I think which is happening now, but I think mm -hmm. it's every six years. Anyways, then they get the data, and then they pour out these NOC codes. But you got to think like some of the immigration programs are using like the NOC version 2011, and I always use the tech industry for example, right? The tech industry has jobs in 2011 that exist now that didn't exist back then. Yeah. You're really trying to fit yourself into something that might be like 10 years old and you're like, you know, I, I can't find my job like it, this doesn't this kind of sounds like it like, you know, and, and these are these are especially in that industry where jobs jobs didn't exist like. Yeah. A while and, ago. And don't despair, guys. If you're ever sitting down, you think, oh, God, I just can't fit into one of these NOC codes. Um, you know, in times past, I've made submissions to the government where I said, look, this person has a mix of NOC codes. One case, an example, um, I helped uh, a, a young uh, woman last year and she was a wedding planner and a photographer because not only did she plan the wedding, she recorded the whole thing with her. her cool. And she, she edited it, everything. And she was, she was amazing. This person, this, this, this woman's skills were, uh, you know, through the roof. But we couldn't go back to the government and say, look, she's a wedding planner because she's all this photography and editing, but she's not a photographer and editor. She's also a wedding planner. Uh, and it was accepted. Um, so you can also mix NOC codes in cir certain circumstances. Yeah. I got to tell you one other thing just to end this off. I had a, a woman come to me. She was refused. Mm -hmm. um, so then I picked it up. Happy ending. And she's, she's now been approved. She became a PR about a month and a half ago. Um, but uh, as you do with the refusals, you're going to get the officer's notes and you're going to look at it. And I, I'll tell you, uh, it was one of the most granular looks at uh, something I've ever I've ever seen come out of there in terms of the officer literally went through her job description and the NOC code, like literally word for word and the interpretation. Like, you know, John, usually like refusal reasons that come out, they're generally about this big. This thing went on for two and a half pages of, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it was it was amazing. So it was just another reminder to me of how crucial, crucial this is. All right, let's move on. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions or concerns, throw it in there. And we do have something, hola, just threw something, hola. Hey, you know what, Ola, thanks for the question. And I know that you've come out more than a few times with us here, so that's great. And we really appreciate that. So is there any way we can check our NOC code to make sure that the employer have put us in the right one we need for immigration purposes in Canada? John, you wanna grab that? Um, hmm. I gotta reread the question, Ola. Then we go check our NOC code to make sure the employer have put us in the right one we need for immigration persons to Canada. Okay, um, what you wanna do in this situation, I gotta split it off into two. If you, if the work experience is already done, right, like you're applying for PR and you're claiming past work experience, it's kind of, you have to go through and decide what the NOC code is. Maybe you wanna get help from someone like us or you just wanna really study the NOC and come into a determination yourself. On the flip side, if this is for, um, a, say, a job offer in Canada and you and the employer are sitting down and trying to, you know, try to drill down to figure out what NOC code is, um, the, you, know, you have to work with the employer. Maybe the employer doesn't know about the NOC code. Uh, oh. 
Now, you know, most don't, so you have to educate them on that or we can educate them on that. So what I would say in that circumstance is, is you work closely with the employer before, you know, anything is set in stone, before the job offer is, is put to you in writing and there's a signature on it and you're submitting it to the government. So work together. If you're confident you've chosen the right NOC code, both of you, great. If not, reach out to us or an immigration consultant or a lawyer and, and get help. But we uh, talked about reach out to us. Come on, man. Whoever's convenient, right? We want to make it easy. We want to, we want to make it easy. I'm just joking. I know, no, I know. Can I, can I actually add a few things into that? So yeah. I agree with every little thing that you just said, uh, especially yeah. if you're setting it up prior to uh, prior to uh, getting the job. But um, the one thing that, uh, when I said that most employers don't know what the NOC is, my experience is, is that a lot of employers, unless they work in HR, they don't know what the NOC is. And this yeah. is crucial. So, and and again, it really just boils down to the language that you use um, and the different things in there. So I, I, again, you can check all of this online, right? And you can just type in, I don't know what you do, uh, Ola, or what type of job um, that you have. If you just wanna type your job in there, I'd like to know because we might be able to just help you out with that. Uh, easy peasy. Um, but basically you can type your job in, or you can type your job in, just type NOC and then the job title mm -hmm. and you can see what comes up. Because the other thing is too, is that there's other different titles in there. And if your job title matches that, that's not the biggest thing. It's the duties and the lead statement and your education. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the biggest thing, but, um, yeah, or you can sit down with your NOC, look at it and make sure that your, um, stuff is crafted. I'm going to say one other thing before we move on with the NOC, do not copy the NOC and put it in your job letter. <laughs> right, John, listen to that. Listen to this man. Listen to this right? man. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag is, don't do it. That is, that is, uh, uh, refusal bait. Um, which, well, I guess that takes us to our next point. Yeah, let's move on to the next point. But that's, uh, you know, I yeah. Anyways, let's move on there. All right, thanks, thanks, Ola. Getting an application refusal. Nobody Too wants right? this. I mean, nobody wants this, right? Nobody, nobody wants this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, a refusal is the culmination of, um, of just bad luck and not usually not being prepared and not doing enough research um not not always sometimes sometimes uh, an officer can get it wrong and i'm sure brandon you and i have fought a few battles where we've said we're going to die on this hill more um, so these days yeah so it's it's you know sometimes refusals are officers fault but i'd say more often than not they're they're you know you're just an applicant's busy they try their very best, but they just get sidetracked. Um, they listen to the advice of someone who doesn't know what they're doing, like a friend or a pal or their auntie who thinks they know what they're oh, talking leave about. That, leave that alone for now. We're going to dive into that. Yeah, I know. Okay. But anyways. That's my biggest, that's my biggest thing. But what do you, what do you do you're going to get a refusal? First thing you do is take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath. Um, what we do when we see a refusal, um, we go to the government, we get what we call access to information request uh, officer notes. Because a lot of times when you get a refusal letter, it's boilerplate from the government. It doesn't really, really tell you what the reason was. So you do an access to information request, costs five bucks, takes around 60 to 90 days in normal times. And then you get the officer's notes back and then you can see exactly what the reasons are. And you know, quite often we can say, look, you know, you're still in Canada on a work permit, still have time, you still got a good score under CRS if it's express entry, this can be fixed. Um, it's gonna cost, uh, you'll have to put in a brand new application, but as long as you can beef up your application, address the reasons for refusal, you got a good chance of uh, rectifying the situation. Yeah, I'm gonna add a few things to that real quick. Um, and we won't spend a lot of time here because nobody likes talking about refusals, but yeah. Um, so refusals are just the nature of the game, uh, you know, and I remember when I got my first refusal, it was like, I, you know, I literally was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe. And John and I have a colleague of ours that she's been doing this, uh, for a while. And we always say, she talked me off the ledge on it.
because I, she's like, look, refusals are going to happen. Like, you know, get it together, man. And just like, you know, you're right and, and dig into it. And I did. And um, what I what I came to understand out of that and what I want to impart upon you guys today is, is this refusals are not the end of the story. Refusals are the end of the story for people who don't understand the system. OK, refusals are just a, a, a function of like, let's go through the process. So I know what happens is, is when I get a refusal, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it. I'm going to go back through my application. I'm going to fire off the access to information request very quickly so that I can get that back as quick as I can. I'm going to then put together a letter uh, and I'm going to try to get that into the hands of, you know, a program manager or somebody that can actually wield some discretion on there. Um, and then I'm going to be mindful of the time frames for me to be able to come back so that I can actually go and, and if need be, go fight that in, in uh, a venue like federal court under something called a judicial review. Uh, we should cover that. It's a, we should cover refusals in detail one day, John. Uh, just like yeah. that, that whole thing, that whole process. I think that, that my application is refused. What should I do? Um, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. And I, I really think that a lot of times, and I'll tell you, I've had people come to me. I had the, the, the most amount of refusals. I saw a woman come to me. She had four refusals and then, uh, I took it on. I said, no, no, this is all wrong. And I said, I took it on and then I filed it again. They refused it on for a fifth time. And I was like, no, you can't do that. And we went back, got reconsideration, and she was subsequently approved. So I guess what I want to leave people with is that a refusal is not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. If you can actually understand what the actual reasons for refusal are and then go back and articulate that, that's it. Now, I'm going to say one other thing, I promise. I'm, man, I'm having such a good time today. The other thing I want to tell people is, is if you get a refusal and you've done it yourself, time out. Don't sit there and start filing it again and start jamming off stuff and doing all this stuff. Don't don't do that. OK. And unfortunately, if you're dealing with, you know, a ghost consultant, as we call them, or somebody who's fraudulent or somebody who shouldn't be doing that or didn't sign the use of rep form, they're going to tell you, oh, don't worry about it. We'll just file another application. Don't do that. Don't do that because you're just digging the hole deeper and you want to understand what the reasons are first and you want to move very quickly. OK. Let's move on, John, because we got to keep to the time here for everybody. Relying on government websites. Yeah. Um, boy, IRCC's <laughs> website is, look at the information's there, um, largely, but it's, you know, it's, it's very hard to navigate. And the only reason, Al, uh, sorry, Brandon and I know how to navigate the, the government website is we go to the government website every day of our working lives and we we reread and we reread and we reread stuff and to, to people who aren't in the industry it's a it's a mess it's like it, it would be the equivalent of me going to canada revenue agency's website and trying to figure out you know a complex corporate tax return using that information it's there but i don't know how to interpret it and i don't know where all of it is it's so, an interpretation of the law too yeah, basically what it is. That's a, that's a really good point, Brandon. A lot, like for instance, a lot of what we use are what's called the program manuals, which are uh, the government is interpret interpreting um, legislation, specifically the Immigration Refugee Protection Act, and saying to its officers, "This is how you should interpret it," and it's publicly available because they decided that this is this is important. Stakeholders need to know about it, which is good. It helps us, but. Don't think that you're going to go to the IRCC website and there's going to be an answer for you there in perfect, clear uh, explanations. It's just, it's just, it's not the nature of, of a bureaucracy putting its information on a website. I got to tell you, I, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to you and I'm smiling, smiling, smiling because I have so much to say on this because it's like, <laughs> you know, like everything, all of these things, right? It's like, okay, so here I'm gonna go in record time, right? First off, it's a government website, all right? It really incenses me when they say, oh, everything's here, you can do it yourself and blah, 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 because it's not, right? There's, it really, it really boils down to what's in the law, 
right? And what the law says, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. On top of that, what John alluded to was all these different program manuals. Previously, in immigration yesteryear, all of that stuff used to be in the different manuals and it was there and downloaded. Now what they've done is they've put up these interpretations of the manuals and they've moved them offline, which transparency wise, I don't like. The other thing is too, is if you read the fine print on the website, it will say that. It will say that this is, you know, this is subject to the law and blah, 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 whatever. I'm not going to get into all of the other different terms there, but it's, it's an interpretation of the law. It's not the actual law. The other thing is too, is that people don't understand. They think that it's all kind of laid out on the government website. It's not. There's a lot of things in there that should be there that are kind of the by the way stuff. So I think we'll just uh, leave it at that because uh, yeah, I think uh, that's yeah. it. Yeah, okay. I mean, government, government websites, um, again, I'll just have one more thing is that some people are are amazing. They can sit down and they can read something like a government website and have the time and the patience to pick all the bits they need apart. Um, and they, they can navigate it themselves, but boy, it's it takes a special person, believe me. You know, the other thing too, I gotta say, is sometimes those wizards are confusing. And the other thing that I hate about that website is I'll click on something and then I'll go to a page and then I'm like, it's like I'm gone in a circle, right? I'm like, click, I'm like, but I've already been to this page. Guys, I, 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 I want you to know, Brandon and I can sit here, hit the record button, and we could we could spend two to three hours just moaning about this. So, Bob, um, we want to be positive, John. I know that's what I mean. We're not going to do that here today, but it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's something else. Yes, I know. It's it's just because it's it's for me. It's I wish that we could just say, hey, listen, here's all the stuff here, and by the way, like you use the CRA example, which is the account of the mm -hmm. uh, the tax. I don't, I, man, I got away from, I, I haven't filed my own tax return in 25 years. Yeah, it's been a while for me too. Because I know that I need somebody there to sort all that stuff out and that's why. So anyways, uh, because it's all hidden in there and don't, I wouldn't even want to know what the CRA website looks like. Okay, let's move on. We got one more, one more, one more, one more. Here we go. You ready? Chat rooms, forum, and oh, your friend's story. Okay, why is this a mistake? Why is this a mistake? Where do you, where do you begin? You know, your friends, your aunties, um, the, the guy who is operates the desk next to you. Um, he may have he or she may have the best of intentions, and they may have successfully put in their own application for permanent residence or a work permit, but their case is not your case. And, um, Gospel. you know, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, the best of intentions, but in, intentions can be, what's the saying? The, 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 the best of intentions is the road to disaster or ruin or something oh, like that. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, well, there you go. Thank you for rescuing me there, Brandon. It really is that case. I mean, I had someone the other day who should have known a lot better. He's actually a, um, not an immigration consultant, but somebody who works in the industry. And he and I were having a polite discussion and he said, well, no, this, this certain aspect makes you CEC eligible. And I said, no, it, it doesn't. And, um, and I go, where'd you hear that? He goes, well, my friend said so. And I go, oh, is, is your friend a, an immigration lawyer, an immigration consultant or a visa officer? No. Right. I don't take nursing advice from the guy who sits next to me or I don't, I wouldn't, I would not go and uh, have my, my account, uh, my, my tax return filed by um, my auntie, right? Like, it's just not gonna, not gonna work. It's, it's the two things that I really, really drive me insane. It's like, oh, I read this on the internet or my friend told me this. And I'm like, my next question is, what does your friend do? Oh, well, you know, she's, she does this or he does that. And I'll tell you what guys, um, it, John, John hit the nail on the head. It's everybody's situation is different. And one little piece of information can change the whole fact pattern of everything. Like the whole, the whole pattern. And this is where, this is the biggest thing that, um, you know, people, people will take what they read or they'll take what they hear and they'll apply it to their own situation where you might get through that or it might actually just change the whole thing around. It's really, 
immigration is a personalized uh, process, and it really is dependent on you, your family. I get it all the time. Like somebody asked me um, uh, within the last day or so, they said, how much time is this going to take? Because my friend said that he got through uh, everything in this time. And I'm like, I don't, I actually was like, I can't even answer your question because I don't know anything about your friend. Uh, I don't know if your friend has dependents. I don't know what country your friend's in. I don't know if that visa post, if, if you have family overseas, is that visa post even operating right now or whatever? And, you know, it's a client of mine and he's going through and I just said, look, you know, I can't even answer that. Like I could sit here and give you some kind of, you know, time, but it's like, I, I don't know. Like there's so many yeah. different factors, especially with COVID, right? Yeah. And sometimes, and, and don't get me wrong, I hate, I hate doing that. And I will tell people, I'll say, listen, here's kind of a best case scenario and here's a worst case scenario. But, you know, you got to understand, you got to take this stuff with a grain of salt. The point is, is that everything is personalized and you can't listen to what your friend's going on or their situation and think that it actually applies to your situation because it doesn't. It really doesn't. And the other nature to this is, is that things change so much. Uh, immigration is dynamic and even more so in the, in the, in the COVID world. Um, but anyways, I think we'll just leave it at that. Um, we got any questions? No, I think we're good. Um, I think we've got, uh, we've got a few people, uh, oh, Donathan wind have given us a heart and, uh, MD. Thanks buddy. Appreciate the, uh, the vote of confidence, but listen, we're at, uh, we're at 30, uh, oh, what happened here? Uh, when you got a question, I'll take it. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Brandon, John, is there more, is there, is that more than one NOC code still give us points for work experience? Um, well, Winda, if, if I understand your, your, your question correctly, if you have work experience, and in that work experience is a combination of two NOC codes, yeah, you can claim it. it, it I have to caveat that it depends on the program. Um, federal school workers are a little bit different from what you can do in a Canadian experience class. But quite often you do get people who have jobs, they have a full-time job, 40 hours a week, and half of their job, 20 hours a week, is one NOC, and the other half is another NOC. In that circumstance, um, you know, there's a possibility there. Again, you're, this, that situation is, is approaching a unique depends on the program. Yeah, it depends on the program. Yeah. So, and, and I, as I take her point too, is that that's John's talking in like in tandem, but if it's in succession where you've done one skilled job and then you've quit that job and then you've started another skilled job, then yes, you can use that work experience, right? When you're going through the express entry system, it will ask you, uh, you know, which work experience are you claiming for your, um, for your code, like for your, uh, what are you what are you filing your application based on but then under the work history you're going to actually file that in so yes okay one last question ola got in under the wire uh here uh is 32 hours considered full-time job yes boom what's the cutoff john 30. boom there you go ola 30 hours is the cutoff okay all right let's wrap it up guys uh thanks for those questions um you know what? I think we will end there. This was awesome. Uh, this I really enjoyed this, uh, and I can hardly wait because we've got five more. There's a second part to this on Thursday. Yes, uh, awesome. everybody, I, come armed with questions on on yeah. Thursday. We love questions. Yeah, and thanks, Ola, Winda, everybody for uh, for that. I really appreciate. We really appreciate the questions. Bring them, bring them. We, I love it. Um, Okay, so let's leave it at that. Um, I guess we've gone half an hour. So look guys, if you wanna get in touch with us, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, Second Passport group, uh, like, subscribe, do whatever you gotta do in there, uh, cause then you'll be able to see our streams. We meet every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, 12.30 uh, Toronto time, 9.30 Pacific. Um, and yeah, so bring your questions and uh, hope everybody's doing well. Do you have anything to add to that, John? No, everybody have a good week. We'll see you on Thursday. Awesome. Take care, buddy. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Hey, Brandon. Okay, take care. Bye, everybody. Have a good, uh, have a good uh, next couple of days. We'll see you Thursday. Take care. Thank you for watching my video. Hopefully you enjoyed this masterclass. Please subscribe to my channel for more updates. We'll see you in the next video.